On behalf of DreamWorks, I'd like to welcome all Guild and Group members and their guests to this Q&A of Warhorse. To begin with, a woman who has produced six movies that have received Best Picture Oscar nomination. She's worked with Steven Spielberg since E.T. Actually, earlier than that, but I think that was her first producing credit. Uh, Kathleen Kennedy, producer of the film. Next guest is an Oscar-nominated production designer. He uh, is responsible for the art direction on this film, which is incredible. Um, please welcome Rick Carter. <laughs> Next guest, Steven Spielberg's first assistant director on his last five films, Adam Sumner, please. A uh, costume designer, also in her fifth collaboration. This was her fifth collaboration with Steven Spielberg, working with him since 1989, Joanna Johnston. Okay. A two-time Oscar-nominated uh, makeup artist, one who won for the movie Braveheart, uh, Lois Burwell. Our next guest is a two-time Oscar winner. He has shot all of Steven Spielberg's movies since Schindler's List, uh, the great Janusz Kaminski. <laughs> and finally, uh, another longtime collaborator of uh, Steven Spielberg a, for the last over 30 years. Uh, seven Oscar nominations, three wins, all for Spielberg films, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Schindler's List, Saving Private Ryan, the great film editor, Michael Kahn. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, thank you, all of you, for joining us for this, and uh, I want to begin with Miss Kennedy. Uh, you are the person, I guess, who is most responsible for everyone else being here, because had you not uh, encountered Warhorse, I guess Steven Spielberg would not have encountered Warhorse. And so if you could just share the story behind um, when you saw it and what you saw in it that made you say this is something that not only would Spielberg like, but that you guys could uh, really do something with? Well, I saw it about two years ago, and I actually went to England on a vacation, and I was taking my two kids to see something I thought they would enjoy. And I was actually thinking how great it would be to go see something that I didn't have to think would have anything to do with work. <laughs> <laughs> so, lo and behold, I was pretty blown away by the play, and my kids were really blown away by the play, and when I got back, it was the first thing I started talking to Stephen about, and he instantly recognized what might be something he might want to do as his next film, so it came together amazingly fast, and I have to say that it, we could only work this quickly because of everybody sitting here. I mean, the fact that all of us have worked together for so long it just, it, it makes it kind of a shorthand. And just uh, one follow-up, which is, it kind of blew my mind, that the rights to the uh, material were not actually, uh, they were actually still available, and that you guys made this all come together pretty quickly, right? Yeah, that, actually that shocked me as well. <laughs> I mean, the play was so wonderful that when I finally sat down with Michael Murpurgo, and that was the first thing I said to him, was why in the world are these rights still available? This is, you know, this is a wonderful story and this should be a movie. And he instantly agreed. And we had a very, very long breakfast. And at the end of about a three hour breakfast, he said, I, I want you to make the film. Uh, as we, b before I continue down this incredible line of, of people, I want to ask you one more question, which is just, um, in this case, can you talk about the, the casting and how that came together? Well, obviously, looking for the part of Albert, Stephen knew that he wanted to find an actor um, that was new and fresh and somebody you hadn't seen before. So that's always a bit of a challenge. You have to cast a pretty wide net uh, looking for 
an actor that might be able to fill those shoes. But as far as the other cast, we had an amazing pool of talent because we knew that we had these various stories, uh, the British soldiers, the German soldiers, the French farm, and we made a decision right away that we were gonna cast um, people out of England for the British parts and we're gonna pass, cast people in Germany and in France, so that gave us an amazing opportunity. Gina Jay was our casting director. We've worked with her before as well. She did Munich with us. And we did a lot of searching throughout Europe when we were casting that film. So it was something that Gina had a lot of experience with and, and she put together an amazing cast. Um, production designer Rick Carter, I have a question for, for you. And uh, well, I have a number of questions, but to begin with, finding and preparing these locations that we see for, for the trenches, no man's land. They, it's not something that you can show up and they're there. So I wonder if you can share the, I mean, I gather it was a lot of uh, work that went into preparing each of the, the various um, locations that we see in the film. If you can talk about that, please. Well, um, I guess I would start by saying we sort of did it the old fashioned way. You know, the John Houseman, we earned it because we actually had to go to places and create things that, um, while they look naturalistic, they really had to be developed so that by finding Dartmoor, which of course is a huge, vast countryside, we found a place that we could start the movie in what I would say is a very um, naturalistic and pure environment because of the rolling hills. But actually, since it's a national park, we had to go in and put down actual netting on the ground and then build up all of the ground on top of that within which to plow. And then by the time we got to uh, no man's land, that's actually out at a airport where we found an area that we could actually create and sculpt to be no man's land. And so there's really a, a, a journey where you actually get to see this pristine environment turn into really hell on earth. And for me, that was one of the, the great opportunities of the movie was to actually make it a landscape movie about a journey with seeing what had become of the land. And it's, it seems from, from an article, a number of things that I read actually, that you were in your own, in a way, kind of commanding your own operation here with this. We're talking, how many people would prepare each of these locations? It was a, a Well, there's, there's hundreds of people that go into it. And, and, and the way that we found Dartmoor was actually because Kathy was delusional one day down in Dartmoor. <laughs> And, and she'd had a very bad cold, and she just started like flailing around. What about that? And what about this? And so, next thing I knew, I was up in a helicopter scouting all over, and finally found this one very remote area that we had to build a, uh, a road into. But the most complicated was no man's land because actually, in order to create the trenches, we had to go in and make all of that secure, and it's 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 the, the size of maybe three football fields because you have a horse running and we had to make all of the roads safe so that everything was actually a lot safer than it appeared uh, when you see it in the movie. Uh, Adam Somner, you have overseen as, as an AD on films like Gladiator and so many others that involved massive crowd scenes, but uh, I guess in this case we're 5,800 extras, 300 horses, include 18 joeys in and of them, you know, just one character. Uh, what, what was sort of the, can you talk about some of the unique challenges that this one presented to you in, in, uh, in just in that respect and, and, and then we'll go on to others. I, I mean, <clears throat> the background stuff was fun and actually, even though this is for large scale, it was actually quite straightforward in the way working with um, the extras was, was great. I mean, the, the, most, the most complicated thing on films like um, like this war horse with, you know, getting the horse's specific performance and dealing with the impatience of everyone to get those moments of acting. And it sort of it becomes some of those scenes where you see the horse reacting with, you know, with, um, with the actors are actually quite ugly process to film because you're, you know, you're catching moments and oh, well, that, that was a good moment there, that was a good moment there. So it was, it was those kind of levels of, on one side, the patience level to get those moments and then to, um, and the safety issues always concerned with you know working with horses on a movie set, I mean horses have better conditions than humans in working environments. I mean there's more security for them than, say, for the working crew. But it's that that, that environment of of working with the horses to get the performance. I think, in the in the, the tight schedule that we always sort of you know, we always find ourselves working in. 
Um, those were sort of one of the challenges, really, of that kind of thing. And, and speaking of the tight scheduling, we're talking, I believe, 63 days the whole production, which, based on the size of it, is pretty incredible. Yeah, well, we, we, when uh, Stephen is always very aggressive in his schedules, uh, and, you know, in the beginning, and and we always end up doing a few more days usually than he than he probably wants. But well, you know, can, can I just interrupt for a second? He started out as our DGA trainee going back to the, la the third Indiana Jones and Roger Rabbit. So the reason Stephen can go <laughs> as fast as he can is because of this guy right here. <laughs> that is completely true. That is absolutely true. But Steve, you know, but it's, uh, it, you know, Stephen is very energetic as a director and also as a producer. So everything he does, he's, he's like, you know, you're almost fighting him sometimes to get more time to do things and he pushes you. But, you know, it, that's the way he works and that's the way he's proven very successful for him, obviously, over the years. So, you know. We actually, we, I don't think Stephen shot a movie that's over 72 or 73 days. So if you think about everything he's done and you look at those movies, not one of those is over that, including Except all the Jaws. Indiana Jones movies. <laughs> Except what? Except Jaws. Oh, actually, you're absolutely <laughs> right, because the shark broke. <laughs> um, Joanna Johnson, I want to ask you, uh, in terms of the look of uh, the costumes and all of this, I gather that uh, Steven Spielberg, and I believe you as well, spent quite a bit of time at the Imperial War Museum and getting an idea of period you know, detail and stuff. And one thing that emerged was that there weren't sort of uniform uniforms in the way that there are today. It was sort of uh, uh, thrown together. And can you talk about, is that a correct interpretation of, of, am I correct in my understanding of that? And also, does that make life easier or probably harder for you, right? Um, yes, I think it probably does all of those things. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we did go to the Imperial War Museum, which gave us all the sort of um, the blueprint of everything we needed. They showed us, um, well, the first pass with Stephen uh, was with the main uh, museum in London. And then I went to Duxford, where they keep all the stock. And they have, you know, Germans and British and all things that we could possibly look at. And they let us handle them and look at the insides. and details that what soldiers had put in themselves. And so that was <coughs> our, um, learning on everything we needed to know. Um, the reality was that there are no uniforms really from the First World War that you can use in film. That um, they're precious now and you know, they need to be treated such. So we had to uh, manufacture quite a lot in quite a small space of time. About, I think we did about um, we got 800 uniforms in about uh, seven weeks by the time we worked out what the regiment was going to be and where Albert would be at that point of the war in France. And the evolution from the beginning of the war to the end of the war, um, as interpreted in the film, that, you know, it's this sort of optimistic, um, sort of old school of uh, regiments that went and they were sort of coming out of the Edwardian era and uh, sort of all polished and brushed up. And then as the war went on, it just went into much more of a ragtag. So by the time we get to when Albert goes to war, it's this sort of, um, uh, you know, a lot of personal interpretation and things from home and things that have been brought in for uh, weather. And it, so it, it sort of, all that sort of pristine uh, cookie cutter look gets all, totally broken down. So it was fascinating, and I didn't realize it myself before this film, so it was a big, big learning curve for me to find out, you know, of uh, uh, the whole history of the war through uniform. And, and just as an aside, I, I believe that prior, right before War Horse, um, Steven Spielberg was making The Adventures of Tintin, that chrono chronologically, is that correct? Tintin was right before? Well, no, I wouldn't say right before, because we started Tintin about six years ago, oh, okay. in earnest. Yeah. And um, we were in the middle of post, and the animators were working, and that's when I had seen the play, and, and Stephen and I naively thought, well, maybe we can do this movie while we're doing Tintin. <laughs> <laughs> and it's turned into far more work than we ever imagined, but it's, it's been very rewarding. The, part of the reason I bring that up, though, is that I, I 
gather that his collab one of his collaborators on that, Peter Jackson, is a big World War One buff. Yeah, I, I actually had been down there, and, and I remember I was I was getting ready to fly back from New Zealand, and uh, Peter said, "You know, I've never shown you, you know, the stuff that I collect for World War One." I. I said, "Sure, you know, I think I'm going to see a few little trinkets, right?" I went in, I'm not kidding, I went into at least three warehouses bigger than this entire theater with airplanes, tanks, trucks, guns. I mean, it was the most insane thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> and so when I got back, I said, Stephen, I don't know how we do this, but Peter's got everything we need. <laughs> and he did. So he did. He, did. he put, sent over some stuff, yeah, right? Yeah, he did. He was amazing. Okay. Um, Lois Burwell, as far as the makeup, I imagine that there, you've, you've dealt with all kinds of carnage before in movies, from <laughs> Saving Private Ryan to uh, Braveheart and Last Samurai and on and on and on. Uh, in this case, I believe there was always a, a decision to keep it PG-13, uh, which meant you had sort of, I guess, working within certain limitations of, as far as that goes. So how does that impact the way that you go about your work as far as presenting the, the real brutality of that war, which maybe was as you know, gory and awful as any, uh, for the audience? Um, well, it, yes, it, it, it obviously was never going to be Saving Private Ryan. Um, but I, I hopefully, um, and it's for you to say and um, not for me to comment on really, but um, you can, if you used a, an expression, um, as well as some of the facial hair that we had on some people, you know, you change their character and you change how they look um, for Yanish to photograph beautifully. And you can convey some kind of pathos. And a blood splatter can actually say more um, in one way than an open artery because we become inured to things. So sometimes something small can be a punctuation that actually has more meaning than something, you know, graphic. But that's what we tried to do. And, and you know, and with the facial hair and, and trying to create the characters, one of the most interesting things, I think, was that some of my team, as well as Sarah Weatherburn, the facial hair maker we had on that film, they brought, and some of the cast, brought in photographs of their relations of their grandfathers or great-grandfathers who had served in World War I. And, and in fact, my uncle, um, as well as my grandfather, fought in it. So we could sometimes make, for example, Sarah Weatherburn made a moustache that I put on a sergeant in the same rank and in the same infantry as her grandfather was. So there was a connection between us and the characters in a way that you, you have an empathy with people, obviously, and with the characters because of the story. But somehow this transformed it into being extremely personal. So when we were in the trenches, which was tough, I mean, it's one of the most physically demanding pictures that I've ever been on. Um, it, there was one day in particular, and everyone will remember it, it was just hideous. It was freezing cold, and the wind was unbelievable, and we were up to our knees in mud. I mean, it was really severe. And no one complained. We were pulling equipment out in kind of, you know, a human chain, and all helping each other, and it was a continuous day, and it was really very hard. But no one complained because we knew that, that real lads had gone through something far worse. And I think that somehow that emotion that we all felt about the story of compassion from Joey and Topthorn and the human story went into the characters, hopefully, that we were making. I guess a unique challenge of this film for you and your team and everyone, I guess, in this film would be working with the horses as well who required their own makeup team. Uh. Oh yeah, no, that was, that was great. I mean, we, the, the, my involvement with the equestrian makeup um, uh, stopped because mm -hmm. you don't handle people and, and, then, yeah. and horses at the same time. <laughs> it's not a good combination. <laughs> but when we first started off, it was great. And one of the things that, you know, and Stephen's always so incredibly generous with all of us in that we get to be creative in a way that you don't always with other directors. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, that is very true. Um, and I could contact the makeup people 
that I knew who had either had horses as a child or still had horses, as I myself do, mm -hmm. and try and get a bunch of makeup people together who could become the equestrian makeup department. And it was fascinating. I mean, it was wonderful. It was all the things you learn as a makeup artist. For example, the, the blaze on their forehead are little wigs. Mm -hmm. That's actually what it is. <coughs> it's a little knotted wig, and Sarah Weatherburn, facial hair maker, used to making moustaches, is now making blazes for <laughs> horses' foreheads. So all the joeys match. So the eye and mouth proportion had to be the same, and the hair was shaved out, and then this wig glued into place by Charlie and the team, who did a fabulous job. So it, it, it was really marvelous. Amazing. It was a marvelous experience. And just, this is, this is neither here nor there, but I just have to say I was shocked to read a statistic. Four million horses died during World War I. I couldn't, I mean, it's hard to fathom. So I, I think another thing that this film do, did is sort of introduce people to that whole aspect of it that's sort of been forgotten. I mean, the last war that was really, that revolved around them. But um, yeah. I want to go now to Mr. Kaminsky. I... <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> The, the look of this film, in some ways, maybe I'm off, but I thought it reminded me a lot of some of the great John Ford Western, you know, uh, whether it was The Quiet Man or The Searchers, maybe it's the sweeping landscapes that you begin with, or um, I don't know, but I just want to ask you if you had any sort of a model that you guys were working from to as far as the style and the color palette and um, the, the look, because it's, it's not like other Spielberg movies as far as I can remember, or Kaminsky movies as far as I can remember. Well, I, I just have to say that I'm a little bit out of place here because just like Lois doesn't, photo, doesn't work with horses, I don't photograph horses. Mm -hmm. So, that's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, the movie was such an amazing experience because it was set in a beautiful landscape, which is Devon, the, uh, the Dartmoor, Dart, Dartmoor, 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 Dartmoor. Dartmoor, do, do, bugs, bugs, no. The boars, Dartmoor, the moors. Moors, yes. It was very beautiful. And, and the story is, of course, about the uh, relationship between the boy and the horse. And, and the landscape plays a very important role in this movie, simply because um, the people were shaped by the environment. And, and it was very primal. The landscape was very primal. So the work had to reflect that kind of a, uh, a primal beauty. So subsequently, there was lots of lighting. We're lighting people constantly, simply because I didn't want the people to blend with the, with the landscape. I wanted them to stand out from the blends, landscape. So in order to do that, you have to bring lights and light them and, 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 and do that to the course of the day. And as you all know, the sun changes and comes in cloud, in, 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 it starts raining, goes into shadows and so, so forth. But we never stop. We always film it. We always work. Um, so it was very inspirational to just be there. I, I find England to be extremely a beautiful country, particularly from a photographic point of view, simply because the landscape is so diverse and the weather changes frequently. So that's always uh, creates a lot of possibilities for great work. Um, and we can define what's great or not necessarily beautiful work, but, but meaningful and great work. Um, so we love being there and working with the British crew. It was a fantastic experience. Uh, this is one of the very few movies that we did outside the United States where um, only a few members of the regular team could travel with me. So I only brought the gaffer, the camera assistant, the operator, and the key grip. And it was a wonderful experience to work with new group of people, new group of filmmakers um, outside the Hollywood, uh, the usual, usual norm. Um, so it was fun. It was good. Some of the shots that I think stay with people or for people who are just seeing it now for the first time, will stay with you. Uh, the longest are the tracking shots in the trenches. There's just something kind of haunting about the way that you filmed those. And I wonder if you can talk about, you know, even logistically how you did it. As, pe as uh, Lois was saying, that the, you're, it couldn't have been easy to navigate that uh, area, and, um, and yet they came out remarkably well. You know, Stephen is great with the camera. He, he really sets up the shots. So. So all those beautiful tracking shots, you should really talk to Stephen about it, because he, he set them up. I, mean, I just made sure they, they, they kind of, things were good that we're photographing. It's always challenging, particularly at night, when, when you have rain and, 
and it's very muddy and, and crew is working really hard and the horses are having, ver uh, horses are having very nice lunch in a warm trailer. Um, <laughs> so, you know, sometimes we're envious of the horses. But, um, you know, Stephen makes amazing movies in terms of the storytelling through the camera. He, he believes that um, the moment you put a cut into the movie, into a scene, you're lying to the audience. So subsequently, uh, all these elaborate dolly moves and crane moves with, with coordinated explosions and, 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 and bullets hitting the ground, they have to be coordinated. So it all plays in the white shot. And of course, Michael, Michael can really talk about it in greater depth than I can. But going back to John Ford, Stephen loves John Ford. I think he, 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 he really sees that filmmaker as a very inspira inspira inspirational filmmaker, and he truly believes that there's no one else that can photograph landscape better than John Ford. <coughs> so it's not that we're imitating John Ford's uh, photography, but that language is so imprinted in the um, language of any contemporary filmmaker who inspires to do good work that, that it's kind of given, you know. Uh, the Searchers, the, 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 the other John Ford movies. Um, if you think of Saving Private Ryan, this, the scene where the mother receives uh, and the, the message that her sons are dead, I mean, it's totally, you know, not imitation, but inspiration. And again, because we love those movies, somehow uh, we just uh, subconsciously uh, use those images, not because we, we imitate them, but because they're part of our language. One thing that John Ford and his contemporaries were unable to do that you guys have made an art form of doing in a lot of your films or the, the handheld camera work. Um, is that something that, uh, you know, w what were some of the, the scenes in which you, um, using that, uh, you know, some of the most challenging scenes in which you employed the handheld camera? But they would have done it except the cameras were so bulky <laughs> that it would take, you know, yeah. a very large man to pick it up. Um, <laughs> but you know, the things they've done that we've tried to still do it, the, the huge, uh, immensely long dolly shots, you know. I mean, they were doing that already. I mean, all the language has been invented. We're not, we haven't created a new language. We just used the te technique that, that existed before and, and used it for our, our own benefits, you know. Um, the handheld comes from, you know, obviously the emotional value of handheld camera versus stationary shadow versus camera that's on the dolly. Uh, I mean, we can talk about it for hours, but, but it frequently comes from also practical uh, reality, you know? There's no room to, to do any other way but to do it handheld. And sometimes it's a conscious choice, sometimes it's a practical choice. A lot of the shots that we did through the trenches, we used um, motorcycle, like a off-road motorcycle with, with gyroscopic uh, stabilizing head attached to it, and we just go through it, you know? I mean, it was a tr truly, truly, uh, adventurous way of making movies, particularly following the horse, you know. And, you know, people say horses are smart, and they're not, not too much smarter than animals. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, it was great, though. Okay. At, and at they have no emotions, by the way. So, <laughs> Stephen did a beautiful job directing Making horses. It, yes. And I think there were less than 13 joeys. How many joeys? Oh, no, there were. 13 joeys. Wow. Eight, I had 18. 12 grips, though. We had 13 joeys. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> At long last, Mr. Kyle, we come to you, and I want to. Uh, <laughs> it seems to me that there were at least two things that were probably very unusual for for you uh, as far as your collaboration with Mr. Spielberg on this film. First of all, I read that you had a trailer on the set throughout the production so that you could work as it was coming along. Is that right? <laughs> it's very <laughs> <swearable>, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've had that trailer for quite a while. And, f and for, the, uh, for that show, I think a special trailer was built for us. And we still have it, we're still using it. And I'm right on the set with the editing equipment. And Steve could run in when he has a moment and look at some footage. And uh, it really pays off for us to, to have that. So wherever we go, we're gonna have the trailer. I can edit there or not edit there, and it really works out well. And, it pro and, and you, the process is just expedited, probably exponential, how, right? Because you can work as you're coming along. Right. Yeah, Steve is shooting a shot. I'm working. Mm -hmm. And it comes off very well. We save a lot of time. And uh, it's really wonderful. The only problem I had, really, uh, as far as the production is concerned, 
cut to cut, I never had so much, so much problems matching horses' heads. <laughs> uh, Joe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I had to match heads, and you had to be cognizant of the fact that the horses are going to be moving around a lot. And uh, we still had to make certain cuts for, for dramatic purposes. And it all worked out very well. The other thing I wanted to, that seemed, I guess, a little different from your previous collaborations with him is that uh, only once before, and I guess that was Tintin, which wasn't that long before, had you chosen to, or had he, you collectively decided to do your editing on Avid versus Moviola. And can, right. can you explain what was behind that decision, finally? <laughs> <laughs> we all love the Moviola. It's what got us where we are. And uh, Steve even loved the smell of it and the feel of it. He really enjoyed it. But we do sit down on an Avid, and you want a trip right away. You don't have to go to a box and get it. You just push the button and the trip was there. <laughs> and, and, and you could plus or minus. It was really quite an amazing machine. <laughs> uh, and I wondered how they could ever build such a thing. It was just, it was just incredible. But uh, after that show, Steve finally said, well, maybe we ought to stay with this for, for War Horse. After War Horse, he said, we'll stay with it. <laughs> So it, it worked out well, and uh, <laughs> we, uh, we, got, we have a good time with the Avid. And I, I was fairly quick on the uh, Moviola, but Avid is 10 times quicker for me. Well, I heard, I think it was George Lucas said, you are the quickest ever on the Moviola. That yeah, was... but, yeah, but gee, the, the Avid, you make a decision, uh, and I'm used to making decisions with film, because you don't want to have to cut a film and put it back together again mm -hmm. with a black frame sometimes. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, this worked very well. I was able to get my matches real fast because I was used to it to get on film. And uh, it was really wonderful. You know, I, I, I was thinking as these wonderful artisans were talking that uh, they all do their work on, on, on the set. And it's all exemplary work, just great work. And it all comes to us. It comes to me and it comes to Stephen. And we sit there and all that work is right there in front of us, all the labor. And uh, we, we run, and Stephen selects his takes, and I go ahead and edit it. And, and, uh, and that was the normal procedure of, of every show that we've done. Except on an avenue, it goes so darn fast. My God, he could give me, he could give me notes uh, Tuesday morning, and I'd show him the, the scene Tuesday afternoon. It went that fast. Of course, it depends on how long the scene is, you know. <laughs> well, and that leads to the next question, which is just, what, what was the most time-consuming, kind of challenging aspect of this for you? Was it the different combat scenes? No, the most challenging aspect of the whole show was trying to get Steven into the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we could edit. I, <laughs> I, <laughs> well, <laughs> we, we'd start running a scene and there's a knock on the door. They're ready on the set. So he runs out on the set. We've only done you know, a couple of scenes to run through and then he comes back and he runs more than they're ready on the set. So it takes three or four times of him coming in. It's amazing how he keeps his concentration. And then he finally marked all his takes and then I could go ahead and go to town, you know, so to speak. You know, the amazing thing with Stephen and Mike is that these guys usually have what they call a rough cut, what most people would call a fine cut, within days after we're finished shooting. It's, it's pretty remarkable. It is, it is. Well, what I would like to do now is turn this over to the audience, who I'm sure have some questions for you guys, and we'll do a few, uh, few of those. So to begin with, uh, up front, ma'am. And if you could just project, and if necessary, I'll repeat the question. I'm just curious as to the, the scene with Joey when he's going through the barbed wire and he gets flipped, how that was done, and... Um... We flipped several horses. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just to repeat for anyone who didn't hear. That's uh, why they had 13 horses. Yeah. <laughs> so the scene where Joey gets caught in the barbed wire, how was that executed? It's actually, it is a mechanical horse, and I have to say it's quite remarkable because at first we thought, okay, this, there's no way this is not going to work. And I think what's really nice is that there's virtually no effect shots in this movie. In the, in the sense that we all think of it now with CG, where there's a tendency for everybody to go, oh, if you can't do that, you'll just do it CG. And I think 
Everybody who goes to the movies subliminally knows if they're looking at something that isn't real. They may not know why or understand what it is the they're seeing. The end was real. But it, what? The end was real. The end? The head. The end. The last fake. shot. Who's fake? Look fake, oh. it was real. Oh. Oh. The end was Sorry, Yannis, real, look fake. <laughs> yes, you're right, Yannis. So I did the other thing, I made a real look fake. No, no need to get defensive. Wait a minute, I thought we did that against a backdrop. We did. Yeah. Of dark. But at any rate, we did, we, we did flip the horse, but then I will say that the majority of that scene is done with a horse named Finder. He was an absolutely remarkable horse that we did use, um, you know, very safe barbed wire that we had to wrap him in. And if you remember a movie called Black Stallion, when the horse is struggling in the sand, the, one of the trainers that we had with us was actually one of the trainers on that film. And um, he showed the Humane Society woman on the set exactly what we were gonna do to create an effect to, to have a feeling that the horse was struggling. So the reason you feel so much in that scene is that so much of it is real. I mean, it's safe, but it is, it's with real horses. Not real no, barbed wire. No, it's not real barbed wire. But it's, it's rubber. Yeah, it's all made to look real, but it's not as though we, we put the horse in as a CG. We, we used, actually used a real horse. Not only that, in No Man's Land, the horse is actually running on track. That, that's, there's a whole road system there. You can't see it, but in, in fact, it's actually made of what they make racetracks out of. So it was actually all created so it would absorb water, and even though it got very muddy in some areas, but it was very well conceived of in terms of the horse's safety all the way through. Yeah, this, the logistically, everything to do with No Man's Land was really quite complicated for every single department. I mean, we had to really go in stages because it was not only you know, keeping the crew safe, obviously, with everything that was gonna be going on with explosions and whatnot, but as Rick said, we had to lay out, it, we had to know exactly where the horses were gonna be at all times, and you have to always be incredibly careful when you're having animals run across landscape. You have to know exactly what their footing is gonna be. Our, our next question is this gentleman over here. The question has to do with new technology and older hands. All of you have been together working uh, through a number of years, having grown up with one way of doing things. And then a producer will discover a new <coughs> technology with the director, perhaps, or will suggest to the director that will save time and save money. And yet, you all have to pull yourselves through to adapt to this new technology. Mike has already talked about the Avid, but I'd like to, and how he found it, he made that transition. But with new technology, do any of you, would you share how you move forward in the process of working from what you are used to to what is new? So just to repeat for the camera and anyone in the back who couldn't hear, just how have, in, in the same way that Mr. Khan made the transition from Moviola to Avid and it was sort of a, a, a big thing, um, what would be similar examples for, I guess, in cinematography or makeup techniques or, you know, Well, I, I can address some of that because I worked on Avatar. So, in, in even Polar Express, and having learned production design the old-fashioned way, where you actually go out and build sets and then you maybe have some extension to go into a world where you have nothing there and you're creating it digitally, the fundamentals are still the same. You, you, the, the idea is that you're going to stage a scene and what's that scene about and it grows from that point. So for me anyway, it's always um, what Robert Zemeckis would call the red button of the scene for the dramatic moment. For me it's a visual that actually anchors why the scene should be designed a certain way and in conjunction with um, the director and the cinematographer and, and the AD and everybody, we work out a plan, but it's, it's still riding the fundamental emotions that create a visual, for me, uh, experience. And so if it becomes digital, it's not just you can choose anything. Um, the one thing you might 
glean from all of this is that, especially from Michael, but, but Janusz or Adam or Kathy, uh, the decision-making process here is very quick and very solid. So it's not just because you can do everything, that doesn't mean you should do anything because you have to make choices. And so I think taking that fundamental philosophical point of view about film and then having it become cinema again, it's no longer film, but still the fundamentals apply. Would anyone else like to add anything? Okay, we'll go to the gentleman in the back, please. Uh, thank you very much to everyone, first off. Uh, and I wanted to say I appreciate very much the John Ford comment and the uh, the response from Mr. Knisty concerning that. Um, in that regard, um, my question is kind of about the color temperature as the story progresses. Um, it seems almost like that first sequence around the Shire until he has to give up the horse is in that. It, it almost seems reminiscent of uh, early or uh, just coming up to Technicolor, you know, and then it changes to to me at least, it seemed dramatically um, at the point when he gives over the horse and then there's the disillusionment of the, um, into the modern warfare. Was that a conscious choice that there was a change in the color temperature or was that, is that just me uh, attributing something that? Just, think, to, just repeat it quickly. Yeah, the color temperature appears to evolve over the course of the film. And, 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 back, and it's beautiful. And, and just is that, a, was that a conscious decision? Well, you know, black and white is great because you don't have to worry about it. You know, you don't have to work with the color. So subsequently, the lighting is totally different because you have to create the three dimensions through lighting. Um, color is a very tricky thing because now you get a color, now you have to tell the story through color, not just through the sets and the wardrobe and costume, but also through the, through the uh, color that you, as the audience, perceive as an emotional thing, right? There's a DP named Storaro who's got all this theory, really great, works out for him, and he can explain really good. But it's basic thing, you know, you start with things, you know, at the beginning, the, 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 the kind of idyllic world of, of, of uh, Joey's upbringing, which is the horse, you know, where, where we wanted to create this kind of, as you mentioned, almost like a technical feel, um, give the audience the sense of what that life must have been, of course, idealized uh, life, what, what that life must have been then. And then once you start going into more realistic, more uh, brutal sections of the movie, you start bringing the coldness of the, of the color, you know, so you start working with, with less filters and you, you apply fewer gels on the lights, you know, and the, the composition becomes slightly different. Um, now, all the choices that we make, as you all know, because you're all filmmakers, they're not just choices because it's fun to do it. They, they, they come from uh, the story. There's a story you follow through and you, you use all the uh, artistic ability that we have, not the ability to be craftsmanship, but to be artists, and we use those abilities to support the story. So Lois does her thing, uh, Joanna does her thing, uh, Rick does my, his thing, and I do my thing, and all those things come in together, and we make those movies. And the reason that we all work with each other is because we see the same movie, the same storytelling. So, you know, going back to the color, blue is sad, orange is warm, yellow is watch out, but then what happens when you switch that around, right? You know, and that's what I'm more interested in. You know, this is very conventional movie, so you follow a certain convention, but, but it's great to do things where, you know, when it's romantic to be actually not warm, you know, or what happens when you're crying and it's really yellow? And there's an example of that in Minority Report where, where Tom, ha Tom, I'm getting my tongues, <laughs> Tom, Tom is confused. Cruzy gets his eyes replaced, right? And, and it's very yellow and grainy and, and kind of, you know, burlesque almost. And, and you'd want to go into more horrorish, horrorish approach with, with blues, but, but yellow was fun because it was so unexpected. So yeah, I mean, we work with color and color palette as the emotional tool. And it's, you know, it's, it's research properly. And I, I didn't do research, but there are uh, psychi psychologists who actually figured out that pink is good for you. You know? <laughs> so. We, uh, we have time for one more question. I'd like to go right here, please. So for the composition of the music, was uh, John Williams the first name you thought of, or Hans Zimmer, or 
part of if Stephen thought of anyone other than John Williams, I think there would be tyranny. <laughs> <laughs> this this was the fortieth collaboration, right, between the two. Yeah, it's they they celebrate forty years uh, this month. Wow. And John turns eighty. Wow. And uh, I think just that we can note the reason that he's not with us today. He's getting a He's getting, he's getting an award at the Kennedy Center to, uh, this weekend. So, so unfortunately, he would have joined us if he wasn't having that award. So excused absence. But um, thank you all very much for doing this. And thank you for coming.